The universe is constantly tending towards disorder and randomness, from mixing milk into coffee to the death of a black hole. All signal a tendency towards higher and higher entropy, towards less and less order. But if that's true, how is something as orderly as life even possible at all, let alone actually being a consequence of entropy? So much so that life's designs are shaped by it. But first, I actually lied to you about something earlier. And the lie is that entropy is the same thing as disorder. If we can get to the bottom of what entropy actually is, all of this will become clear as day. This all begins with answering a simple question. Why is it so hard to unmix things? Let's begin with a thought experiment. Let's pour some dye into water. We intuitively know that the dye will disperse out into the water, but if the opposite happens, you can immediately tell that the footage has been reversed. The same way that watching a tree grow in reverse makes you scratch your head. But why is that? And here's why thinking like a physicist can serve as a great basis to understanding biology. Some of you might wonder if it's the fluid interaction that's causing this even mixing. So let's simplify our dye problem to an almost cartoonish level of simplicity. Let's get rid of any complex fluid behavior and view this as if we're dropping a bunch of red M&Ms in a jar full of blue ones. If you shake this up and down, the reds will obviously mix with the blues, but if you shake it down and up, this doesn't reverse the action. This is known in the thermal lingo as an irreversible action or process. So even without any fluid physics, you can see that this reverse footage behavior still happens. So let's simplify it even further. Let's look at just one M&M and restrict its motion to a simple grid. This M&M can move in any of the eight directions by one square. Essentially, it's just like the king on a chessboard. Let's unfreeze time and let this thing move. If we draw the directions for the next move, you can see that there's only one move that brings it back to the starting square and seven other ones that bring them elsewhere. So ask yourself, what is the M&M likely to do next? You're right, there's an overwhelming 7 out of 8 chance of it not moving back. If we play the same game over and over again, you can see that there are fewer and fewer ways to get back to the center. The chance that the M&M moves away from its origin is far, far higher than moving backwards towards the center. This idea is even more exemplified with many particles. There are 126 ways to arrange 5 M&Ms inside of a 3x3 box, but there are almost 2 million ways to arrange them throughout our entire grid. The chance that we find our balls back at the center is 126 over 2 million. That's less than 0.007%. This is why dye diffuses outwards over time and why milk mixes with coffee or why heat flows from hot to cold. It's just far, far more probable. And this is what entropy is actually describing. Entropy measures the number of ways something can happen on the microscopic scale. This is the intuition behind Boltzmann's formula that was carved in his gravestone. Entropy is proportional to the logarithm of the number of ways something can be arranged on a microscopic level. The more probable direction results in a positive change in entropy, and reversing that results in a negative change in entropy. Thus, entropy always increases within our system. And if we realize that the whole universe is just one giant system, we arrive at the second law of thermodynamics. The net change of entropy of the universe is always greater than zero. Though that does rhyme with disorder increasing at times, the essence of it is not about that. If the thing you're looking at has a negative entropy change, it means that it will very, 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 very likely not happen at all. In the context of biochemistry, you can exploit this fact to predict chemical reactions, but more on that later. Hmm, but why is there a log there? Isn't it better to just use omega itself? Well, how do we turn 0.001 odds into something negative? Or the reverse, how do we turn 100 odds into something positive? Math has a tool for that, and it's called logarithms. 
the log of anything bottom heavy turns negative, while the opposite turns positive. This gives you a rather useful consequence of entropy. You can add and subtract it. And if you hold that thought for just a second, I'll show you why this little definition is crucial for explaining why life can occur. Picture yourself picking out clothes from your wardrobe. You have five pants and 10 shirts. In total, you'd have five times 10 equals 50 possible ways to dress. But let's say you gave away one shirt and you bought one more pair of pants. You'd have six times nine equals 54 ways of dressing. You may have lost one way of wearing your shirts, but you've gained one more way of putting on the pants, which actually result in four more ways of dressing up. This is the same logic that entropy operates under. You've lost entropy of the shirts, but you've gained entropy from your pants selections, and the net result gave you more entropy. It's just like how living things are very low entropy systems, that, but the heat we radiate, the CO2 we breathe out, the waste we produce, all of that results in the net increase of entropy of the universe. This is the second law of thermodynamics. We can destroy entropy within our system so long as we increase entropy elsewhere. We are permitted to exist because we contribute a net positive to the heat death of the universe. This law might seem like a huge limitation to life, but why I found fascinating during the research process of this video is that reframing the processes of life through the lens of the second law reveals just how this limitation is exploited to the moon and back. By the way, if you're an educator or student who wants to use some of my visualizations, feel free to use them for your courses while providing the credit. Although one thing I've learned is that making your own visuals and animations will exemplify what you want to teach way more. I've actually learned a lot of my Blender animation skills from today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives with thousands of classes led by industry experts across film, illustration, design, freelance, productivity, and more. Skillshare can help you take your career, skills, hobbies, and passions or side hustles to the next level. Their Learning Paths feature makes this easier by giving you sequential class collections to master a specific skill or competency. There are many useful classes that are great for getting you started on making your science visuals. You can learn about all the tools you need for graphics design. You can learn about the art and science of drawing through Brent Avistin's Learning Path. He's one of the best teachers I've ever seen. You can come along and take the same Blender courses that I do. From up-to-date Blender for Beginners courses, to making smooth, amazing, realistic animations. The first 500 people to use my link in the description will receive a one month free trial for Skillshare. Get started today. Proteins are the workhorse of the cell. Originally, they come as chains. The flavor of each link in the chain dictates its shape and what function it has. On average, a protein chain can have over 10 to the 30 different shapes as it folds, but only one is correct. That's 1 trillion times more ways than you can arrange a Rubik's Cube. Isn't that going completely against entropy? No. In fact, it actually immensely increases entropy. We are mostly made up of water. Some parts of the protein dislike water. They're hydrophobic. When the water interacts with the hydrophobic parts of a protein, the water isn't really attracted to those regions, so they interact with themselves to form a structured cage. This, of course, restricts their possible arrangements, but if they simply just let the hydrophobic part displace those water molecules and interact with one another, eventually drawing them to form and define the inside of a protein, those waters are free to go wherever. It's one protein's freedom against a horde of water molecules. This is one of the driving forces of life's ability to do things without having a guiding hand, the ability to self-assemble. It's one of the core properties of a living thing, driven by entropy. Cell membranes are also assembled using the same principle. These walls are crucial for keeping unwanted things out. But the magic happens when we allow some of those unwanted things in. In our mitochondria, we have a wall that keeps the protons out. Of course, they want to equalize and achieve more ways of arrangement, a lower entropy state. So, 
The cell exploits this by putting ATP rechargers, ATP synthase, into these walls. The equilibration of these protons is used to drive the recharging of ADP back into ATP. Entropy has earned the mitochondria the moniker of powerhouse of the cell. ATP itself is yet another agent of entropy, because it can make processes that go against entropy happen. The reason why the first step of sugar metabolism requires ATP is that the reaction itself decreases the entropy of the universe, while ATP to ADP does the reverse at a larger magnitude, fulfilling the second law of thermodynamics. Although you'll typically hear biochemists discuss these changes as Gibbs free energy changes, Gibbs free energy measures the energy that's free to be used before you transition from a low entropy state to a high entropy state. It's a more practical way to state the second law, as the chemical system is more relevant to us than the whole universe. Much like a spring, chemical reactions that release free energy actually happen, and the reverse are far less likely to happen. Gibbs free energy gives us a practical means for predicting biochemistry. So, a lot of the processes we have in life all of a sudden make sense with the second law in mind. But what I'm about to tell you next is that life isn't just allowed to exist under the second law, but it's a direct consequence of it. To uncover why life is a consequence of the second law, we begin with another thought experiment, one that we've already visited. When you connect something cold with something hot, the heat flows as a gradient into the cold. After a while, the temperature equilibrates. The low entropy state of having all energy packets on one side evolves into one where the packets are equally distributed and has more freedom of possibilities, just like a membrane. But if we change this setup by putting a fluid between the two heat sources, something interesting happens. If the temperature difference isn't great enough, there is a gradient as usual. But if we kept on increasing and increasing the temperature difference, dragging the system further and further away from equilibrium, the fluid starts to change. The fluid forms these convection cells. The fluid moves in a more orderly fashion, making the entropy lower. So to increase entropy within the system, it lowers its own entropy? Well. That is, until we look closer at what these convection cells are actually doing. Do you notice that their very restricted nature allows the heat transfer to happen more efficiently? With the convection, the heated parts are more readily put into contact with the colder ones, accelerating the heat transfer compared to simply letting the heat spread. In fact, you've encountered this very setup every day. Clouds form because of the warmer earth and the stark coldness of the atmosphere. Tornadoes form when they're in high temperature differences. In fact, the thermodynamic basis for an entire climate system is the dissipation of the gradient between the equator and the poles. What's common to these phenomena are that they exist between extreme temperature gradient differences. Once there is a high enough gradient difference, it's favorable for many systems to self-assemble into orderly structures to dissipate low entropy more efficiently. These structures are aptly named dissipative structures, and they caught the eye of one Belgian physicist, Ilya Pringagin. He argues that life is just another example of dissipative structures. Now, he wasn't just interested in temperature gradients, he also saw the same phenomenon in chemical gradients too. Life is, after all, composed of biochemicals. Once large chemical gradients are imposed, there are certain highly structured reactions that can be induced. For example, if we have a simple gradient where chemical A can convert into chemical B, and there is an excess of chemical A, i.e. a gradient that's large beyond a certain threshold, if chemical B were to come back into catalyzing this process, the gradient can be dissipated faster. This is known in the lingo as autocatalysis. And if you layer a bunch of autocatalytic reactions together, you can get systems that feed back onto each other. This can create oscillations through time and space and even long-term memory. All of these are highly systematic chemical dissipative structures. The reason why I brought these up is that life's chemical reactions are full of these motifs. 
the cell divides based on an oscillator that feeds back on itself. Once they divide, the cells have to look for and remember signals that determine which body parts they develop it into using bistable circuits through mutual inhibition or positive feedback. At a more complex level, they can even send signals that oscillate through space, forming the wondrous body plans that we are so familiar with all stemming from basic autocatalysis. So not only does life exploit entropy to drive its processes, it's in fact entropy that made the systems that way in the first place. Well, but where are we getting these chemical gradients from? Won't we ever run out of low entropy? If we get our gradients from the chemical energy of food, then won't that eventually run out? Well, yes, that is true. If the Earth is a closed system, that is, you're forgetting that we also have the Sun. All of what's interesting on Earth, the way life began, is perhaps a simple result of dissipating the immense temperature gradient between us and our star. Back then, this very same gradient favored some chemicals over others, and out came autocatalysis from the woodworks. In the present, higher entropy carbon dioxide can be recycled as sugar in plants with the low entropy photons from the sun, providing food for the entire planet. We are here then and now because we dissipate gradients extremely efficiently. All of this is a beautiful and elegant way to describe reality. It even led Prigogine to a Nobel Prize. However, the diverse, non-linear nature of life and its processes causes his math to break down in more complex cases. The theoretical framework of all I've said about dissipative structures is still an area of cutting-edge research. However, in the next part of this video, there is another physicist who would pick up on Prigogine's work and obtain fascinating results that not only fixes the holes within the theory, but he also discovered that things such as replication, reproduction, and even evolution can also be explained through the lens of the second law. We'll be delving into the most cutting edge research in this field. We will be exploring the work of Jeremy England. That being said, if you take anything away from this video, it's overwhelmingly clear that life isn't a contradiction of the second law. It's driven by it. We can understand and predict so much about the whys and the hows of life by simply looking at it through the lens of the second law. And in part two, we will be pushing these ideas to the extreme. But this won't be our next video. In the next video, we'll shift our focus from viewing life through the lens of thermodynamics to another enlightening lens, a quantum lens. Special thanks to Film for helping with the research and writing of this video. He's an incredibly passionate student in physics who is only 18 years of age. I'm glad to have him as an intern for NanoRooms. Another shout out goes out towards the EduTuber 2025 Accelerator Gang for helping me with the YouTube stuffs and sharpening this video to its highest potential. And thanks to you for watching this video. Thank you immensely for watching.